Welcome back to my series on setting up, restoring, and modding now a um, Thorns TD-160. This will be, uh, this is the second one I own. Uh, so things, circumstances have changed since uh, we first started this. I was actually setting this up for a friend and uh, he wanted to sell it. And I started going through it and was showing him my progress and everything. And then uh, we came to an arrangement and I decided I wanted to buy it for myself. And uh, so that's what we're doing. Um, it's not to say I may not list it at some point down the road, but uh, right now I uh, wanted to have a little bit of creative freedom so that I, I didn't want to just uh, bring it back up to its uh, original factory spec with the original plinth. Uh, it's no secret that I'm not a big fan of these uh, the plinths on these things, so uh, uh, what I'm going to do is swap the, the plinth out probably and put a, a more robust one. Um, I got a hold of a slab of uh, MDF that uh, I will be doing the uh, base plate with. And uh, yeah, so I've got uh, some plans for it. And I may do a custom, uh, a custom uh, acrylic uh, dust cover for it. So stay tuned for that one. I've also got another video showing how to make acrylic uh, uh, dust covers with a uh, DIY bending machine that I created. But uh, I've got an idea for this one that'll be a little different than that. So maybe we'll go through that process a little later on in one of my other um, parts here. Um, so this part, I wanted to focus on the top part of the platter. And uh, we did the motor, we did the head shell in the previous part. And uh, now we're gonna talk a little bit about the, uh, the bearing and uh, properly lubricating it and also putting the platter on we'll talk a little bit about belts and we'll talk about how we properly balance uh, the arm and how we verify our tracking forces um, as well as anti-skate um, there are some uh, idiosyncrasies with this particular one for uh, setting your anti-skate so we'll go through that uh, just so you have a better understanding um, remembering these were made uh, long before standardization ever made, became a, a thing. Um, so um, what we'll do is uh, go through all of that and uh, and then we'll do the uh, protractor. So uh, what I did was I printed out a uh, Thorns bare walled arc protractor. Uh, the beauty is these are free. You can actually go on to uh, this website right here, which is vinylengine.com. And within the site, all you have to do really is Google Thorns Bearwald, and that's how you pronounce or spell Bearwald, Arc Protractor. Uh, there's a number of sites that uh, actually um, have grabbed a hold of this and, uh, and um, are available. So you can um, print it out. Um, the, the key there though is you have to print it out um, to scale. So most printers will give you the option of fitting to page um, or printing the actual size. Um, and this was probably made for uh, A4 or a European size paper which is a little bigger because uh, you can see it's sort of at the edge but you've got all the information you need on it if you print, print it on a standard 10 of 8.5 by uh, 11. Uh, North American sheet as well. It's just it looks like it's cut off in the bottom, but you've got everything you need. Um, so how do we tell that um, when we look at the protractor? Well, the idea is printed out, and if you're not sure whether it's to scale, they've got these two lines here. Um, we got A to B here, or sorry, A to A there, and B to B on this line. And on here it says A to A is exactly 140 millimeters. So it's of course metric, so make sure you have a metric ruler. And uh, you basically measure it and make sure, yeah, that one corresponds to 140 millimeters. And then the B to B distance is 200 millimeters. So if it's not, if it doesn't measure to be 200 millimeters, then you don't have it printed off to scale and then this is useless. Um, 
The beauty to uh, of this uh, this protractor is there's a second page that tells you what arms and what uh, what turntables it actually is uh, designed for. Um, it also tells you the uh, the uh, mounting distance that's uh, used. So that's your distance between the pivot point to the center of your spindle, which is uh, f supposed to be 215.6 millimeters, which is usually what the TD160 series turntables are, unless you've got uh, uh, an odd tone arm, like a super, where you've actually taken the, uh, the Thorns turntable off, or tone arm off, and change things up so that your, uh, your mounting dis distance is different. Um, so then it's got this instruction set on what to do, and uh, you basically follow that. It's, uh, it's kind of an idiot's guide. There's also lots and lots of YouTube videos out there on how um, to uh, set up a turntable, how to set up the arm, how to use a protractor. Uh, I would suggest maybe Michael Framer is a, uh, um, a well-renowned uh, turntablist, I guess, or audiophile. And he's got some really, really good uh, demonstrations that, uh, that go through the whole tr uh, turntable setup process. Um, and more for generic turntables, uh, so it's not specific. So my goal here is to you know, make a, a, a turntable specific to the TD-160-0 or TD-160. And this also applies to most of the other uh, turntables in that class, like the TD-165. Uh, 145 uh, um, and you know the auto uh, lift table variants and uh, any ones that use kind of this arm and, and that sort of style um, so yeah so we're going to uh, jump into uh, doing all of this that'll be the very end doing the uh, the protractor after we set the arm and all that sort of stuff and uh, we want to lubricate the bearing, and that's what I'm going to go through right now. So I'm going to bring the camera a little bit closer so you can see the action going on with the table itself and not have to stare at my face, and then we'll go through that process. All right, we're now back up and uh, set up with the camera a little bit closer so you can see what's going on. And uh, as you know, we cleaned, out the cleaned off the motor and everything. So before we start uh, re-oiling the... Uh, the bearing, the platter bearing, um, what we want to make sure is that all of the old oil is, uh, is out of the, uh, the bearing well. So I actually did it before, but I'll, I'll just run by uh, what I do and what I don't do. So one of the things I don't do is I don't use these uh, cotton swabs in order to get into that bearing. Uh, the reason is um, these things are famous for flaking off. You can see the little fibers and everything. And of course, what happens is if you're in a sloppy inside there, you could actually uh, knock off some of the fibers and not get them cleaned out of the uh, the bearing well. You want to keep that bearing well as clean as possible. Um, this particular bearing was, you know, there was a little bit of oil in it, but it was mostly dry. And uh, so what I did was, uh, and, and the good thing is it wasn't uh, really goopy and it wasn't really uh, dried out. Um, and so I gave it a good clean, but what you want to do is uh, I find uh, wooden chopsticks or even the back of a, uh, a paintbrush, uh, one of these fine paintbrushes that I use for um, uh, painting some of my uh, uh, DIY uh, audio projects or whatever. Um, so what you want to do is find a, I don't have a really good one here, this is a bit thick for the thick for the job, but uh, what you can do is use the stick to probe with a, with a lint, -free, lint free cloth. Um, so these uh, space age fibers sometimes can be if you've got an old t-shirt that you can rip up or whatever. Um, you don't want to have it too thick, so you want to be able to get down to the bottom of the well and get basically get everything cleaned out. So you just you know probe it down and then just swab it out and make sure um, it's all cleaned out. As I mentioned, I did this one before before I decided to uh, show folks what I was doing. And uh, the other thing is also the uh, the bearing itself, the bearing shaft and the pin, the uh, the pointy end. 
you just want to give that a nice good clean make sure there's no dried goop on it have a visual inspection make sure there's nothing cling clinging to it like any dust dust bunnies or or balls of fiber or anything like that you want to make sure that bearing is nice and clean and then you can actually go over it with a uh, I don't know if I have one here um, a alcohol pad or whatever um, I had some but uh, let me uh, go upstairs and get one Right back again so uh, luckily lucky for me my wife's a nurse and uh, she brings home hundreds of these things in her pockets uh, from her day-to-day -day use so uh, these are just little alcohol swabs that like you can get in restaurants or uh, uh, the nurses use it prior to uh, stabbing you with a needle and it's just basically a lint-free cloth with uh, soaked doused in uh, isopropyl alcohol you just want to give that a good little swipe and the beauty is it will uh, completely evaporate in, in air so it's not going to leave anything behind and it's like 99 percent pure so you're not having any residues so if there's any kind of sticky oil that's uh, adhering to your uh, bearing shaft uh, that will clean it right off and uh, and actually what i do is uh, use a use a new one here um, a lot of times what I'll do is use these and I'll just wrap it around the end of uh, either, well, maybe let's use a bigger diameter um, chopstick. So you can throw that down the bearing shaft just to make sure I get everything and you can use that to bring it back up and it doesn't really come apart so you can see that uh, it's very clean so uh, that bearing wall is there's nothing left in it I think I did a good job of cleaning it but uh, let's just double check and yeah all good so um, now what we're going to do is we're going to use um, a light machine oil now don't be fooled by all these gurus online that uh, want to sell you, you know, a milliliter of uh, some special uh, oil made by Tinkerbell and doused with uh, fairy dust. Uh, because really, this is not rocket scientists. These are not uh, high-speed bearings by any stretch of the imagination. 33 and a third it, uh, RPM uh, is not high speed. Um, Thousands of RPMs is high speed, but not 33 and a third. So you don't need any magic elixir um, that's going to break the bank at $50 a milliliter um, to pad somebody's pocket with uh, cash. What you need is a really good light machine oil. Um, and I am a hydrocarbon engineering technologist by uh, education, so um, I've studied um, oils and viscosities and petroleum products and all of that sort of stuff for a number of years and uh, just know that there is no magic elixir here so what I use um, I've used 3-in-1 motor oil or not motor oil 3-in-1 oil um, it's really good uh, lubricates penetrates rusts cleans so it's a, a really good uh, good multi-purpose oil that's plenty good enough for this application and it can be cleaned completely out, and you can put a new fresh batch in after a while. Uh, what I tend to use is a Singer sewing machine. My wife has a, a Singer sewing machine, and uh, we buy this stuff. And it's probably, uh, you know, as, as good a light machine oil as you can find out there. And uh, if you have access to it, uh, really, really good, or even a 3-in-1. I wouldn't... Uh, shy away from either of those. Um, but there are lots of light machine oils out there. Like I say, this is not rocket scientist science. So, um, now how much do I put in? Well, that's the $10 million question. What you want to do is put in enough, put enough in um, to make sure that you uh, have the entire bearing covered with, uh, with lubricant. But you don't want to have so much in the well that when you push 
put this in, it's going to come back up and spill all over your nice clean turntable. So it's kind of a little bit of a trial and error. I'm, I'm sure somebody has a magic milliliter fi figure to uh, put in there, but I just tend to um, put about, I don't know, 20 drops or whatever. 20 or 30. Some people just say half fill it. So I tend to uh, just go on the underside and then just keep adding. And then what I'll do is I'll put something around it. So if it does weep over and you have overfilled it, that uh, it's not going to go all over your turntable. It's just going to, and then you want to have a tab out here so you can pull it out. Um, so it's going to pick up any excess oil if you've overfilled your uh, bearing well. So let's put a little more in. And then we'll pull the uh, shaft out. And then we're going to just make sure as vertically as possible you're going to slowly slide it in. And a good thing to indicate, you'll see it takes a while. So let's get it spinning. And you'll find that it actually now has a suction to it. There we go. So I think it needs a little more oil. Usually it takes a while for the uh, and actually we can use uh, instead of this I'll just poke a hole in a paper towel so that'll, it's more absorbent than that uh, cloth that I had. See how it's slowly sinking in now? So now we're getting to be where we, we want it to be. Straight up, and I think it still needs a little bit more oil. Uh, it's starting to come up now. Oh, there we go. It's not overflowing. I can see it. There we go. Now look at that, it's just going to spin and spin and spin and spin. And I think we're good there. It was just almost, oh, you could see it welling up on the side. So all that, that lubricant, that bearing is fully lubricated. And then we can pull this apart. And you can see just a little bit has soaked, soaked over and, uh, and gone onto the cloth instead of your turntable. Oh, and you can feel the suction there. There. There's nothing on the turntable, so I think we're perfect for the amount of lubricant that we need. You can see it's slowly sinking, and that's just the suction. That's how, much, how tight of a fit that bearing is with the lubricant. And it'll finally seat itself, and actually, if you spin it, it'll go down a little bit faster. But now we're... Uh, I think we're ideal. And look at that spin. That's a good thing. It means you don't have a bunged up uh, bearing. And uh, life is good. So, what kind of belts do we use? And I think I uh, spilled the beans a little earlier in, uh, in one of my... Uh, parts before this, but uh, we're going to reiterate ourselves here, and you can see it's still spinning, so uh, that is a good bearing. You can time it and then uh, 
write it down and then uh, do it again in a year's time and see if uh, if uh, the lubricant is uh, wearing down or, or changing or whatever. I'm not that anal. I just kind of do this every couple of years and that's, and that's probably too often. But uh, just to uh, double check it. So there's two types of belts that I would recommend. Um, there are aftermarket belts that are much cheaper that you can get on, uh, I think Amazon has them, eBay has them. They're no-name brands, and the trouble with that is they don't, they don't conform to the standard that was specified by Thorns back in the day. And uh, you will note that uh, all these people with their phones, they think that their phones are magic calibrated uh, RPM uh, indicators, and they're not. Uh, your best indicator is going to be a strobe, and that's why on this uh, bare wall uh, protractor, um, they've got, and I've cut the hole already, um, they've got a 33 and a 45 uh, strobe on there, and then you need to have a, uh, a lamp that, uh, that oscillates at, uh, at your line frequency, which is 60 hertz in uh, North America, 50 hertz in uh, Europe and elsewhere. Um, and then you just shine the light on here and you can tell whether you're, sp you're slow or fast on the, uh, on the turntable. And generally there is no adjustment other than a darn good belt. So the two that I recommend are the Thorin's belt. So this one's a little bit, uh, and it says www.thacker.eu. Uh, it's an original Thacker belt. It's called Thorin's. Uh, part number is 6800574. And uh, I've got three of those belts. And if you look at the uh, label on the belt, I don't know if you can see through the bag there, but it says Thacker on it. And then uh, there's the Thorin's belts. And I don't know if I've got one kicking around. Uh, I did have one. Might be on one of my other turntables already. Thacker, Thacker, Thacker. There's one that instead of saying Thacker, it actually says Thorns, and it's it's manufactured to the same exact standards by the current Thorns company, which is by no means the same company. Well, they've bought bought and paid for the name, but it's uh, actually uh, been restructured a number of times over the years, and they've moved their factory about four times. Um, so. Um, it is a good product. It, uh, it conforms to the same standard that Thacker builds theirs to. Uh, so I think the two belts are actually synonymous. I do have one kicking around. I just uh, I thought I brought it out, but I guess I didn't. Oh, it might be in here, actually. Yeah, I think this is it. So this is the uh, from the Thorns Company. And it's, uh, again, uh, same part number. Uh, but this one, if you read the belt, it actually says uh, Thorns on it, I believe. I shouldn't be handling it with my with oily fingers, so I'm not going to open it up. But uh, underneath that label, it actually says Thorns uh, imprinted on the belt. So Thacker, Thorns, same part number, same exact spe specifications. Uh, those are the only ones uh, to use. Now here's the uh, the Thorns uh, letter that comes with it when you buy it. And on it it says, Thank you and congratulations on your purchase of an original Thorns genuine belt. We wish you many years of happy listening. The belt is one of those consumable items that should be replaced every three to five years depending on environmental conditions. Once it dries out or stretches too much, it can, be, it can affect the pitch of the music and as a good indication, it's time to be changed. If there's anything we can do, da 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 da, da. So in, in, you know, three to five years, you could probably stretch it for longer, depending on how much you use your turntable. And if you're not using it very much, you could, uh, you know, get away with much longer. But uh, if you're using it all the time, uh, probably a good rule of thumb. But uh, you be the judge. And if things start slowing down because it's stretching, um, that's the time to change your belt. So that's how you do your speed adjustments on these things. That and having good lubricant, because if it starts slowing down, it also could be your uh, lubricant is getting too thick and too viscous. So uh, again, uh, just monitor that with your strobe, and you should get a really good idea as to uh, 
how well your uh, turntable is performing. So next, uh, we're going to put one of these belts on. I've got three of the Thackers, so I'm going to put a Thacker belt on. Not that it matters. It really doesn't. And sometimes what I do, especially since we just oiled that and I got a little bit of oil on my fingers, what we're going to do is we're going to use some surgical gloves uh, that are hopefully oil free. And if you, it's a little ripped there, but I'm not handling it there. Um, then, uh, then you can also, if, if you do get oil on it accidentally, you can use isopropyl, one of these uh, isopropyl alcohol wipes. In fact, I may just do that in case I have a little bit of residual oil on the, uh, on the gloves, because uh, I've reused them. Uh, what we'll do is we'll rip one of these bad boys open. Now it's not a good idea to use a lot of isopropyl alcohol frequently on belts like these because they do isopropyl alcohol will dry it out. But uh, you know, a one-time deal just to get rid of any oils on uh, from skin oils or uh, oils from the uh, from from uh, oiling your uh, turntable. It's not a bad idea to just give it a good swipe because then you know that it's just rubber that's interfacing with the edge. Now we clean that out in the earlier segment so the edge of the uh, the platter is nice and clean and you can actually see that we've taken a little bit of uh, you know a little bit of dust and uh, and dirt and all that stuff but now what I do is I always put the label out because that way you can actually see when you lift your uh, um, outer platter out what kind of belt you have and making sure that it's correct so that you want to be able to and I'm kind of anal I like to have Thacker the right side up instead of upside down uh, so what we're going to do we clean the uh, we cleaned off the spindle there and the pulley and then you're just going to rotate it make sure there's no twists in it just give it a rotation just to and then it'll start to settle down at the bottom but remember we've got more weight to put on here with the outer platter and once the weight pu pushes the suspension down that belt when the uh, the outer platter is on will actually play more in the middle of the uh, the platter um, Once again, I do have a 3D model for uh, replacing, for putting a, uh, the standoff post here to prevent actually damaging your, uh, your uh, spindle or, or uh, drive shaft or uh, pulley system. Uh, I haven't done that yet, but uh, we're just going to be extra careful. So on here, we have the, uh, the um, factory made uh, 45 adapter, which just fits inverted. Uh, I think I showed you earlier, I've made 3D models of those that are available online. If you've lost yours, you can print one out and use it. It doesn't matter whether it's metal or plastic. And then be very careful putting this. Don't let it fall onto your, uh, your spindle. And just gently place it on here. And there. And uh, earlier in the uh, parts, I, I showed that I was missing the rubber platter. I went back to the fellow I bought it from and he actually found it. So now we have the original rubber platter. Now there's, this is another one of those uh, fairy dust kind of things. A lot of people, and, and you know, there is some science behind it. Um, some people prefer felt mats, which I have. And some people prefer uh, cork mats for various reasons. And I've got the felt mat here, some of the pile of stuff here. So you could, uh, you know, use that instead, or you could use a cork mat instead. There's actually one, a cork mat you can get for thorns that has the 45 adapter uh, thing. If you're going to use the cork mat, cork mat with the 45 adapter in there and not take it out, then you can just put it on top. But then you have to adjust, if you're concerned with it, the, uh, the vertical tracking angle or your arm height. If, again, you're that anal about it. But uh, there we go. So now uh, what we're going to do 
is we're going to have a look at, remember we uh, set up the, uh, the TP60 arm there, or the head shell, with uh, the stylus using my uh, jig, which is the Thorns jig, which is this little guy here. So we got the uh, pivot distance to stylus tip measured correctly by using this uh, jig that fits over top of here. So it's ballpark, it should be pretty close to this, but that's providing it's not using another... Uh, uh, system like uh, Lofgren or, but this is Barrowald so uh, that's the recommended one for uh, thorns so we put that on I shaved the corners here just to uh, show it and then what we can do I've already just uh, so what you want to do is zero your uh, anti-skate on this according to the procedure in here so let's follow the procedure actually so you got a little recipe or an instruction set here. It says, you know, here's all here's all the uh, arms it works with, the turntables it works with, and the distance uh, between here and here that it works with. And then uh, if it says, if this uh, pivot to spindle distance is not exactly 215.6 millimeters, don't use this protractor. It says right, uh, right there in big bold letters. Um, so if you have a different type of arm and that distance has been changed, uh, this is not good for you. Um, so one is print it, which I've done. Check the distances, A to A, B to B, which I've done, uh, which I explained to you. And then rescale if the distances are not correct. Uh, cut out the black hole. Using a pin is good. I use just a, a, a razor knife. And uh, set your anti-skate to zero, which I just did. And... Now the stylus must follow the arc. Use the C and C prime um, dots. So there's C prime there and C. So what you want to do is orient this so that, and then you can just use it by hand, and then you want to put your, rotate it until this is right on the C, right like so. And you want to make sure, and it's not following the arc. Back again, friends. I, uh, rather than uh, monkeying around with this for a whole long time on camera, I figured I would sort of get it to the point where I was happy and then uh, just sort of explain it a little bit because a lot of these things require a little bit of uh, monkeying around, and uh, that's pretty typical. Um, so, uh, what I did was I had to uh, move the cartridge uh, quite far forward, but uh, uh, not all the way, or if not all the way, it's very close. And so what I did was I adjusted the arc protractor, and the way the arc works is the arc should be centered on the... Um, um, the pivot point of the uh, the tone arm and uh, essentially uh, what you want to do is make sure in order to get the uh, you know the correct pivot point to stylus tip distance it should inscribe itself on this arc here which is the Barrowald uh, geometry uh, versus Stevenson or um, any of the other types of geometries that are out there and there's a number of them um, so what you do is you, uh, like I say, you put a pin, pin prick hole in, uh, C and C prime. And then, uh, if you sit it in there and then you pick it up and then you should be able to inscribe that arc and be able to drop it basically into the hole there without moving the platter. And that means that you are now, and it doesn't go any further than that, that means your overhang distance from, uh, from here to the, uh, the, the stylus tip and also from the pivot point to the, uh, the stylus tip is bang on. So there we go. This is uh, meeting the bare walled uh, geometry. And then the other part of it is once you've got the, uh, the distance correct, you also want to make sure the cartridges align perfectly within the... Uh, within the head shell. So what you do is, again, you put a pinhole uh, where the crosshairs are on this little grid here, 
you drop it down gently so you don't want to be ripping your stylus off the cantilever and then you look down it and you say well oh this one is a little crooked so what you want to do is adjust the the, the cartridge in the mount without adjusting you know without changing your uh, your arc parameters and then you get it to a point where you look down and there's other guides that uh, and that's about it right there it could use a little bit more and this is a real quick and dirty way of making sure your cartridge is set up so that you get the two nodal points and then another uh, kit that I have here is it's the Hudson's kit which is a uh, allows you to do your overhang here as well it doesn't tell you what uh, geometry that they're following anywhere on here as far as I know uh, but it works in a similar fashion but you just make sure your that's your two nodal points and if your cartridge is perfectly lined out in both those points then you're uh, then you're correct whatever geometry that is so that that's why I prefer to use the uh, arc protractor more so than these quick and dirty things. The other is this uh, little chummy here. So when you put your stylus down on the record player or on the record that you're playing, and it'll be a little higher because this is paper thin, uh, you would apply this to the side of it and then you would see if the arm is actually parallel to the, uh, to the surface of the record. And if it's sort of up angle or down angle, then your VTA is incorrect. So um, I can do it from this side. So I'm going to do it, I'm going to drop it down over here. And just even if the record was elevated, and then I can see that the arm is just pretty, pretty in there solidly. So or it's, it's horizontal, so to the uh, playing surface. So, yeah, um, looking good. So now what I want to do is tighten those screws down without moving them. Just to make sure I haven't... Yeah, that's still, still darn good. So that's perfect. So what I want to do, so as I mentioned before, what you want to do is tighten them or loosen them just to the point where you move it, but that they're not sliding and slippery sliding on the... Uh, on the head shell that way um, when you uh, tighten it down that it's not going to move the uh, the cartridge head so you just do it very very carefully and then once you've tightened it down go back and measure make sure you haven't uh, shifted anything I'm going to do that off camera because you don't need to see me doing hours and hours of that uh, but um, that is the finicky part of doing a uh, doing a turntable so now we've got the uh, the geometry of the arm uh, set up correctly geometry of the head shell and the cartridge inside the head shell um, we're applying the uh, thorns barrel well bar barrel wall protractor arc protractor uh, geometry correctly and uh, so everything should be correctly set up and it is significantly different than the uh, geometry uh, portrayed by the uh, the jig that uh, comes with the turntable um, so I'm not sure if it, uh, which, which geometry it follows. It doesn't really say I don't believe in the manual. Uh, I may have missed that. So uh, we're going to go with this, see how it sounds at, at the end of the day. Um, so we've got the, uh, we've got the um, oil uh, applied correctly to the uh, bearing well. We've got the motor done. We've got the, a new uh, um, belt put on here. So I think we're now ready to close this uh, close this up. Oh, the other thing is uh, tracking force and adjusting the uh, adjusting the arm. So that's the uh, another sort of fiddly part to do. Um, what I'd like to do, so we've got and also we've got the anti-skate here on zero and that's what I explained what I would uh, I would uh, differentiate and We'll do that in a, in a second here. 
Well, I'm a little bit bummed out. Um, so I uh, started doing the uh, the geometry of the arm and checking everything out. And I put a uh, spirit bubble on top of my head shell here. And noticed the bubble was way up on this end here, as you can see. Let's see if we can get that to focus. And normally what I do is just do a, a horizontal, just to make sure, which of course it, it is horizontal and it's correct. I can adjust it, as you see there. However, what I didn't realize was the head shell is actually canted. Instead of being horizontal to the uh, playing surface, it's actually canted down. And when I looked at it closer, I noticed that the arm tube here, so the arm tube is straight, and uh, I sort of did that when I was using the uh, this uh, this gauge here that I was uh, showing on how to uh, make and making sure your vertical tracking angle is correct. And I noticed that this is this uh, bayonet mount here is actually canted down. So somebody during the uh, its lifetime had actually either well, tried to lift it up or had dinged the uh, the arm. Or the head shell down and bent it so it will never ever be the same um, so that arm is shot so i found one uh, on ebay it's uh, direct from switzerland it's a brand spanking new arm board so it's going to cost about 150 bucks to replace it so uh, what i'm going to have to do is put this little project on hold um, i've ordered the uh, the new arm tube. Uh, there's only seven left from Switzerland. Uh, they bought up all the old uh, stock from the company when uh, when, they, when they when they I guess they were um, reorganized back uh, back years ago. And uh, I'm very fortunate that I can actually find an arm for it. I've done one on uh, my previous 160 up top where somebody had actually dented the uh, the tube here. It was still straight, and I still have that, and it's actually probably a better arm than this that I could uh, get away with uh, doing in the interim, but it, re it actually requires extensive surgery to uh, take this arm off. Uh, the tone arm, uh, the Q lever assembly down below, uh, and so I'm going to basically just order the new one from Switzerland and, uh, and go with that instead of a... Uh, I just don't want to have a big big ding in the in the uh, tube. I still have that uh, that arm, and it's perfectly straight and everything. It's just that it, uh, looks like somebody dropped a, a heavy uh, heavy uh, item on top of it. So so there we are. We're in pause mode. Um, we'll see if I can do any other stuff. Uh, what I was going to do is set it up in the uh, natural um, uh, plinth instead of go with the new plinth. Uh, I wanted to get it all set up that way, and then I would swap out the plinth at the very end. So, uh, so I think we're in a, in a, into a stall pattern here until I get that uh, that arm from Switzerland. In the meantime, I've got other projects to work on. So we'll uh, come back to this uh, forum and thread uh, once I get that arm, and then uh, I'll. In the meantime, I'll post the. Uh, the other turntable ride swapped out a brand new arm uh, from the same place and uh, arm tube and uh, and we'll pick it up from there. So uh, yeah, a little bummed out this is going to be a slow, long, long, laborious process, but uh, in the end it'll be worth it. So thanks for watching.